Uh, this thing is like everything wrong with word rescue multiplied by like six or seven times or something. Okay, so any of you remember my coverage of Word Rescue back in episode 84? Well, if you do, then you know exactly what to expect in today's ancient DOS game, Math Rescue, right? Wrong. Typically when someone makes a sequel to something, either one of two things happen. Either the original formula is expanded upon with all of its original issues ironed out to make for a more solid experience, or new technology is introduced and experimentation happens to make for a game which tries to be very different, but still incorporating elements of the first to remain familiar to some extent. Math Rescue is like a strange hybrid of the worst aspects of both of those ways of making a sequel. It's no wonder the third game they had planned never came out. To put it simply, Math Rescue has issues. A lot of issues, and we'll be diving into them quite a bit later in the episode, so apologies to anyone who played this as a kid and enjoyed it. Me personally, I was so bored and frustrated with this thing by the end of the first episode, I disabled the math problems to help speed things along, and even eventually turned the difficulty down so I could just get it over with, since doing these things will literally cut the amount of playtime to expect down to a third. Math Rescue is developed by Redwood Games and published through Apogee in... Uh, where did all my numbers go? Oh, <laughs> stupid gruzzles. I don't even have access to my Sega Death Phaser at the moment. Well, actually, not really all that much is missing, is there? Hang on a second. There. 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 And there. Okay, good. Temporarily fixed. So yeah, developed by Redwood Games, published through Apogee in 1992. Same year as Word Rescue, actually, which makes me wonder just how much time was spent making this thing. It's a one-player platformer slash edutainment title, supporting only EGA 320x216 color graphics, ad-lib music, and PC speaker sound effects. As for its current release date, it's still shareware, and while there's more than one way to obtain this game, the best approach is likely to just get it straight from the 3D Realms website at www.3drealms.com, as it only costs $5 there. However, I highly recommend thinking twice before burning money on this thing. Instead, download the shareware version from your shareware website of choice and just try it first, because unless you have nostalgia tinting your opinion, you're probably not going to enjoy this thing. Once again, not much to say about the- oh, <laughs> hang on a second here. Okay, so the game story. Basically, not much to say about it. The Grussels are back and stealing all of Earth's numbers and it's up to you to stop them. Actually, the story in-game does go on to explain a few more of the things you encounter, at least to some degree, such as Benny the Butterfly's appearance and the garbage trucks, which- oh, wait a minute, Benny the Butterfly? Benny was a bookworm in Word Rescue. I'm pretty sure it's caterpillars, not worms, which morph into butterflies. You know, maybe they're brothers and just happen to have the same name. Actually, if that was the case, then one of them would have had to have been adopted, and... Well, you know what, I'm reading way too much into this, let's just move on. So the gameplay at first is going to seem a lot like Word Rescue. In fact, the controls are almost identical. Moving left and right, jumping, climbing up and down ladders, and sliming enemies. Actually, that is one positive thing I'm going to say about this game, is that they at least solved that control glitch with climbing when using a joystick. In Word Rescue, since jumping and climbing were both mapped to the same button, you couldn't climb with the up direction and instead had to press the jump button. Here in Math Rescue, both work for jumping and climbing. 
One thing that's going to immediately strike you as off though is the speed of the gameplay because it's going so much faster here than in Word Rescue. This is actually the default speed the game plays at, and there's no references anywhere on how to change the game speed, save for a couple little controls in the instruction section. In fact, the speed of the gameplay is not even saved between sessions or with the player data, so if you alter the speed setting, you have to remember how you altered it if you want to have the same speed setting again the next time you play. Still, I didn't find out about the whole speed thing until later, and quite frankly, the default speed the game expects you to be able to play at is very fast and very hard to get used to, especially coming from Word Rescue and especially given all the things going on now in each level, as you not only have to collect special number cards, but you want to try and collect them in order for the most points, and you also need to be aware of the garbage trucks. Well, let's talk about the cards first. When you touch a number card, you get presented with a math problem to solve either a straight-up equation or a word problem depending on how you've set up the difficulty settings. You answer each problem by moving underneath of the numbers you want to input and jumping. If you get the question right, the card disappears from the world and you get a piece of the key to unlock the door to the next level. If you get the question wrong, a gruzzle appears. Now, this is the first major issue with this game, is the noticeable clunk of the integration of the educational component with the entertainment component. Word Rescue never, and I mean never, pulled you out of the gameplay experience to quiz you, and certainly not 20 times in the course of a level. Yeah, if you're playing on any skill level other than easy, you need to collect all 20 number cards on a level to progress, and each one asks you a math question. Given 20 number cards and 15 levels per episode, this means to beat the entire game, all three episodes, you need to answer a minimum of 900 math problems. Do you have any idea how freaking long this takes? Heck, did the developers even clue in on this? I mean, come on, this is a program meant to teach math, and simple math just revealed how utterly ridiculous of a prospect this is. Oh yeah, and if you die, you restart the level, even if you already answered all 20 questions. Actually, unlike Word Rescue where you always died in just one hit, here in Math Rescue you can take quite a few hits before going down, thanks to the garbage can lids you can find scattered around, or win from the bonus rounds between each level, with each one protecting you from a single hit. Though I should point out that the placement of some of these lids is a bit troubling, as the majority of them are hidden in secret rooms, and since your lids are not restocked when you die, it's very important to make ample use of your slime, which you can stockpile much more easily as you get slime simply by collecting the math cards. But speaking of garbage, there's also garbage trucks traveling around in fixed patterns in each level. The idea here is that these garbage trucks get in the way and hurt you if you touch them under normal circumstances. However, while garbage trucks are present in the level, an equation will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. If the truck you touch has a number on it which matches the answer to the equation at the bottom of the screen, you cause it to explode into a giant ball of fire. Yes, you are seriously going around as a kid earning bonus points trying to detonate garbage trucks. <laughs> The implications of this are just mind-blowing, and did anyone stop and think that maybe, just maybe, this was reaching a bit to try and make math more entertaining? I mean, this game was intended to be played by kids as young as four years old. You wouldn't do anything so stupid as to reference killing things or death, or... But... What? What? Why in the nine hells of Bator does this kid-friendly game meant to teach math over the course of 900 plus questions have a word problem referencing killing things? You just, you, you just don't do that! <sighs> okay, deep breaths. This game doesn't quite get what it means to be edutainment. Edutainment is meant to entertain and educate at the same time. So far, this thing doesn't educate very well, and it isn't very entertaining either. So where does that leave us? Well, if the gameplay is solid, and your overall presentation is good, then you could probably still recover from this mess. So, would you believe we still have a ton of issues to talk about? Let's start with one of the more odd ones. See that lid count up in the corner? One would tend to think of it almost like extra lives or a health gauge, but what's the minimum it can get to? One? Zero? 
Well, technically both. See, if you only have one lid left and get hit by a Gruzzle, you die and have to restart the level. If you only have one lid left and get hit by a garbage truck, you go down to zero lids. And if you have zero lids left when you touch anything dangerous, you die. So yeah, that's just a small sample of some of the odd things this game does. Now, I already demonstrated just how ridiculous things can get due to not ha getting your lids back when you have to restart a level, but it's even worse than it seems because this affects your slime supply too. And on the hard difficulty setting, Gruzzles constantly respawn. In fact, depending on their spawn position and where you ended up sliming them, they'll sometimes respawn the instant they're done being slimed. Although, this only does happen when they're on the edge of the screen, thankfully. There's a whole bunch of minor issues with this game too, such as being dragged off the corners of ledges you should be able to get up, lava animations sometimes stopping in parts of a level while they continue working in other parts of the level, and even the climbing animation gets mucked up if you're not perfectly centered onto a climbable object. Actually, one of my favorite mistakes made in this game is the first of the ending screens for the third episode, where the artist completely misunderstood the concept of proper comic panel design, given that the word balloons are ordered right to left, instead of left to right like they should be. Another thing I find ridiculous is that some of the word problems are formed perfectly fine, but are given numbers which don't make any sense at all. For instance, one time I got a word problem stating that some kids' parents were allowing them to watch 50 15 hours of TV a day. I mean seriously, if you're gonna randomize the numbers for these problems, at least make them plausible. I swear, somewhere on this planet is someone who saw that problem come up with a huge number as a kid and they went home and watched tons of TV and when told to get off, they simply told their parents that said program let them watch X number of hours of TV. Actually, stretching the realm of possibility even thinner, I should mention the level design repetition. So, Apogee titles were known to have excessive repetition going on in a lot of them, and Math Rescue is no exception. But the thing is, the ordering information makes it feel like that this wouldn't be the case, as it says you follow the Gruzzles into outer space in the second episode, and visit Candyland in the third episode. And episode 2 starts off with some space-themed levels, all well and good. At least save for the tiles all being solid and thus not permitting the background to shine through, but this only lasts for four levels. Level 5 is titled Volcanoes of Venus, and uses the volcano themed tiles from the first episode. Level 6 is titled Under the Seas of Venus, and yep, uses the underwater graphics also from the first episode. Level 7 and 8 are both underwater stuff, then you go back to more volcano stuff, with the only references to anything space related being in the titles of the levels. So, marvelous. Episode 2's space theme is only true for a portion of it, and then you have to use your imagination for the rest. Episode 3 starts off with candy-themed levels, as you'd hope they would. Level 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all of them keep the theme going with minor variations each step of the way. You know, maybe Episode 3 isn't going to have any of that repetition nonsense of Episode... Uh, I jinxed that one, didn't I? The last thing we need to address is that some of the level designs are just plain evil, as they absolutely require you to find secret areas to progress. Well, thankfully, there's only a few levels like this, but when it happens, it can be extremely confusing trying to make any progress. Like right now, I don't have the vaguest idea where I'm supposed to go, as both sides of this path are dead ends and I don't have enough cards to get through the door. There's no warp signs, and the floor beneath me is perfectly solid. I mean, really, I've spent five minutes up here trying to find a way out, and I can't... Okay, you know what? Maybe I just have some older version of the game, and all of these issues got patched up at some point, and I'm just getting angry over nothing. So let's just go check the version number. I mean, it's gotta be 1.0 or something like... Overall, Math Rescue is a disaster. It's poorly designed, poorly planned, poorly executed, glitchy, buggy, finicky, and just a plain old mess. It's very hard to imagine that this thing is the sequel to Word Rescue, because that game wasn't that bad. It wasn't a great game by any means, but at least it provided some level of entertainment. It had a subtle educational component like any edutainment title should. 
Here, the educational components and entertainment components were smashed together so hard that they just grinded against each other, leaving pieces of themselves scattered everywhere, leaving us with a game that isn't very educational and barely entertains. And it probably has a level of nostalgia for some viewers, but as a game, I just can't recommend it to anybody. But let's at least end on a couple positive aspects. The graphics are nicely drawn, and the bonus rounds between levels are quick and responsive. Plus, you can skip them if you don't want to play them, unlike the rest of the game. The setting this game up in DOSBox is simple enough. You can just leave cycle set to auto, and if you want to use a joystick or gamepad, you need to turn off timed intervals. Otherwise, your calibration settings may not work properly. Actually, the game's native joystick support has issues with navigating the menus, so you may wish to simply use DOSBox's key mapper to remap keyboard keys to your joystick or gamepad. Though, given that you have to press number keys directly to answer questions during the bonus rounds, you may just want to stick with the keyboard controls entirely. Anyhow, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week for episode 160, we're going to be taking a look at a Legend of Zelda clone. Yes, I am well aware that it is still edutainment month, so make sure you take that into consideration when you send in your guests to adg at pixelships.com, and tune in next Saturday to see how this combination is even possible.